Eighth of Sun's Dawn, 4E202, Day 176. Refreshed after a good night's sleep, we made our way south to Stony Creek Cave to eliminate the bandits that Brunewolf told me about. After clearing out the cave, we continued on to Riften. We made good time and reached town just before lunch. I found Miole in the market and handed Grimsever to her. She was astonished. After exclaiming over my skill, she asked if she could travel under my mentorship to learn. Since I have just taken on Anarchy, I could not accept Miole's offer. We spent a restful hour at the inn having lunch. Afterwards, I walked over to the Honor Hall Orphanage. As I entered, I could hear the voice of an old woman from the next room. She was promising to beat the children if they shirked chores, and then she told them they would never be adopted because nobody wanted them or needed them. After forcing the children to say they loved her, she called them gutter snipes, and they were dismissed. A lovely but unhappy-looking young woman approached me. She asked me to leave because none of the children were up for adoption, and she did not want any of them to get false hope. I asked her if Grillud was always like that, and her answer was as I feared. Grillud appeared to be a bitter old woman, punishing the children for whatever unhappiness her own life had held. I decided to talk with the old woman to see if I could reason with her. Children should not be treated that way, and I was certain that homes could be found for some, if not all, of them. They seemed afraid of Grelod, and several begged me to take them away. Clearly, the orphanage was not a pleasant place to live. Grelod had moved into a back room. I asked Anarchy to wait with the children, made my way to the headmistress, and closed the door behind me so I could speak with her in private. She was extremely uncivil and would not even turn around to speak with me until I mentioned Aventus Aretino. Then she stood up angrily, faced me, and called him a bastard. She said that she was going to find him and give him the beating of his life. I took a step towards her, perhaps intending to shake some sense into the old hag, but she raised a fist as if to swing at me. Lola saw that as a threat to her beloved mistress, and she lunged at Grelod. Before I could intervene, Lola had grabbed the old woman by the throat, and I heard a sickening crunch. The old woman had cried out in alarm when Lola jumped at her, so, of course, everyone came running to see what had happened. I tried to shield the sight of her now lifeless body from the children, but to no avail. Rather than being upset, surprised, or afraid, they started celebrating. It was utterly unsettling to hear them saying things like, Grelid is dead, yay! Or, kill one person and you can solve so many problems. Constance, the helpful young woman, was terrified and would not come near me. I think she was afraid she might be killed too, which saddened me. I did not intend for this to happen. I left the orphanage with a heavy heart, hoping that the children would overcome both Grelod's harsh treatment and having witnessed the old lady's death. I walked to the Temple of Mara, made a hefty donation, and spent the afternoon in prayer and contemplation. After all of the bandits I've killed, one might think that taking lives came easily to me. The difference was that bandits were ruthless killers themselves. They preyed on the weak, and nothing short of death would stop them. Grelod may or may not have deserved to die. She was not a killer, but it could be argued that she also preyed on the weak. In her case, however, I did not think it was my place to act as judge or executioner. 
I could only hope that the gods would forgive me for the actions of today, that hopefully all the good I have done would far outweigh this mishap. Dinya Balu, the head priestess at the temple, says that Mara will indeed bless those who spread her teaching of, teachings of love, compassion, and understanding. I asked what I could do to help atone. Dinya told me the best way was to help others find their way to the gift of Mara's love, and she gave me some specific tasks towards that end. First, I am to find Fastred in Iverstead and help her settle on one of her two suitors. I could hardly believe it mere coincidence that I already knew something of this case. Fastred was Bodhi's daughter, and they lived on the only farm in Iverstead. Two men in town, Klimek and Bassianus, were vying for her love, and she has been unable to decide between them. I resolved to speak with Fastred about this when I traveled through Iverstead on my next visit to the Greybeards. With an active plan for atonement, I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders. I thanked Dinya for her wisdom and guidance and left the temple as the sun began to set. I had one more task to complete before dinner. The Hall of the Dead was located underneath the Temple of Mara. In order to save Constance from having to worry about Grelod's body, I was hoping that the grave tender of Riften would take care of it. I found the priestess, Alessandra, busy with another body when I entered. She spoke rather bitterly about her vocation, saying that she had never wanted to be a priestess of Arche. She blamed her father, who was a priest, and forced her to learn all the burial rituals and prayers. Her father died before her training was completed, yet she continued to study and become a full priestess in honor of his memory. I asked her how she might be able to make peace with her father. Alessandra spoke of her father's ceremonial dagger. She wished to have it returned to his grave, so I offered to help. She told me to take the dagger to Anders, the priest of Arche in Whiterun, and he would know what to do from there. Alessandra agreed to help me in return, so Anarchy and I left the Hall of the Dead and went to the inn. We ate a small, silent meal in our room. As I lay down for bed, it was a relief to finally put this day behind me. I prayed that Kinnereth would let the sun shine tomorrow. I could use the brightness to lift my spirits. Ninth of Sun's Dawn, 4E202, Day 177. The day dawned cloudy and overcast, mirroring my still melancholy mood. But at least we had no rain for our journey back to Windhelm. Riding northward, I noticed that the dragon mound just off the road as we approached the sulfur flats looked different. I reined in Winter Wisp and stopped to investigate. Instead of the usual convex mound, this one was now concave, like someone had dug most of the dirt out. Oddly, though, there was very little dirt around the outside of the stone circle. What had happened? We explored all around the site, but we could find no clues to satisfy our curiosity. Feeling rather frustrated by the unsolved puzzle, there was nothing more to do except mount back up and continue on our way. The rest of our journey to Windhelm passed without incident. Once in the frosty city, I quickly sought out Brunewolf to tell him the bandits had been cleared. He was pleased with our work and gave us 750 septums. Next, I did some bartering at the market stalls, procrastinating my visit to the Aretino residence. Eventually, I ran out of time-wasting things to do, so we finally made our way over to the boy's house. 
I informed him that Grelod was dead and that he should go back to Riften. Aventus was overjoyed. He was also convinced that I worked for the Dark Brotherhood and said he wanted to follow in my footsteps. Nothing I said would dissuade him, much to my consternation. At least he finally agreed to go back to Riften after they've, in his words, had time to clean up the mess. Aventus gave me a family heirloom as payment. I planned to give it to Constance at the orphanage. Someday, the boy might like to have it back. With our tasks in Windhelm complete, it was time to deal with the dragon at Mount Anthor. The guard had told me it was northwest of Windhelm, so we started off towards Winterhold. I knew of a path just south of the whistling mine that led westward into the mountains. It seemed a logical place to start looking. On the bridge just east of Windhelm, we were attacked by three more of those strange, masked cultists. None had any clues on their corpses, but I think we can safely assume they were also sent to kill the false dragonborn. A courier caught up with me as we walked past Angus Mill, and he handed me a mysterious note. He said that some creepy man in black robes had paid him a hefty sum to deliver it. The note itself was cryptic. It was a black handprint made in ink with the words, We Know, written underneath. I surmised that the note was from those crazy cultists. They seemed rather persistent, but I was not going to be bullied, especially not by the likes of them. Following my planned route, we traveled up into the snowy passes. Our exploration took us first to the Shrine of Azura. It was an impressive structure, but we did not spend much time there. Standing at the top of the monument and gazing across the landscape, I could see many interesting buildings down below and in the distance. As I was surveying the land around me, a huge bronze dragon crossed my vision. He circled the peaks to the southwest and then dropped down out of sight. I could not be certain, but it appeared that he might have been settling to roost. Realizing that he could be the beast living at Mount Anthor, we headed that direction. Farther along the path, we came across the remains of some refugees and their wagon. They appeared to have met with some kind of violence. There was nothing to be done for the poor souls, Arkay blessed them. We rooted through the items strewn about in the snow, but there were no clues as to what happened there. As we started to move on, several huge boulders rolled down from the mountain just ahead of us. Had we been moving any faster, we would have been caught in the rock slide. Turning back to look at the broken wagon, I think I knew what had happened to the travelers. We investigated the rocky ledge above us, but there was no sign of foul play. Moving forward, we crested the hill and could see Mount Anthor's ruins before us. The wind was blowing so ferociously that we could barely hear each other speak. Unfortunately, that also meant we did not hear the dragon until he was upon us. There, at the crest of the hill, he swooped down to welcome us with a gout of his molten breath. Anneke was severely burned and fell into the snow to soothe her wounds. I had thought I would be relatively safe from the fire, given my previous experience. However, even I was blistered wherever my skin wasn't protected by thick armor. Forcing my arms to move through the agony of my pain, I dug a healing potion out of my pack and quaffed it as fast as I could. The magic tonic worked immediately, and determination replaced the pain. I grabbed my bow and turned to face the creature while knocking the first arrow. The dragon made pass after pass, blasting us with flames. 
We managed to avoid most of his molten breath by ducking under and behind the rocks, living, lining the narrow road. Anarchy and I took every possible opportunity to shoot at him, our bowstrings twanging in a quick counterpoint rhythm to the dragon's guttural shouts. Eventually, I could see blood dripping down the beast's body from arrows that had successfully hit their mark. He appeared to be tiring, so I ran down the slope towards the ruins where I could face him on more even ground. Rather than follow me, the accursed beast roared and flew back over the side of the mountain. I ran back up to the crest and looked everywhere, but I could not see him. When it became clear I was searching in vain, I limped over to check on Anarchy. She was on her feet and seemed to feel better after soothing her burns in the snow. We stood there, holding each other up until our breathing and pounding hearts returned to normal. We then turned to walk down the slope into the ruins when, again, with our backs turned and with no warning, the dragon reappeared and let loose his terrible fire. With echoing cries, Anarchy and I each leaped to opposite sides of the path. This time we were quicker to take cover and were not so badly burned. The encounter went much the same as before, with us both firing missile after missile into his thick hide while he flew about and scorched everything in his path. And again... Just when I thought he was too injured to remain skybound, he flapped those great wings and banked off behind the mountain. This time, I scrambled onto Winterwisp's back and rode to the very top of Mount Anthor for a better view. Still, I could not see the beast anywhere. I waited for an hour, alert and anxious, but there was no sign of him. We picked our way gingerly back down the steep slope and then grouped up in the ruins to decide what to do next. The sun was getting low and we were exhausted and hungry. I hobbled the horse away from the main ruins under a rocky ledge and far enough away that I hoped she would be out of battle should the dragon return. Anarchy and I sat wearily on a low stone wall and ate some dried beef cheese, and bread. She kept an eye on the sky while I took some time to peer about the ruins. Right across from where we sat was the most prominent feature of the area, a rune wall. It was remarkably well preserved, much like the one inside Bleak Falls Barrow. It had been built into the side of the mountain protected from wind and rain by the natural stone formations around it. I could not see any glowing runes from where I sat, but I knew what I would find when I got closer. After our meager meal, we felt rested enough to explore. At the base of the steps to the rune wall, there were three human corpses burned beyond recognition. More bones were scattered about, both human and animal. There were several urns half buried in the snow, and an alchemy table had been set up recently, I thought, on an ancient stone altar. There were several paths leading away from the site. One led due north, down to an elaborate circular stone platform. One went northwest, towards an ancient barrow atop an island in the distance. Another led west-northwest and wound around the mountain towards a Dwemer ruin. And finally, to the southeast, was the slope that we came down. Looking for a suitable place to make camp, we explored around the circular platform to the north. It appeared to have been a sacrificial altar. There were human bones around the site, and a skeleton was laid out on the altar, somehow still perfectly intact. Several weapons, armor, books, and sundries lay on and around the altar. No sooner had I touched one of the books than the skeleton on the altar sat up and drew a weapon to attack me. I was so surprised that I jumped back, 
and by sheer instinct pulled out my mace and sent his bones flying. Behind me, I heard Lola and Anarchy battling as well. I turned to find that two more skeletons had risen up from the snowy ground and were attacking. I put an end to one, while my companions took care of the other. Neither of us wanted to camp near the platform, so we moved further down the path to the west. There was no obvious area large and flat enough for our tent. We finally settled for the most level section of the path we could find. It was not as protected from the wind as I would have liked, and, God's mercy, somehow I had lost our fur tent. I racked my brain, trying to remember where I had used it last. I suspected it had been left behind at High Rothgar, next to the brazier where I slept those few nights. With my mind in turmoil during that visit, I can see why I might have been less organized than usual. The other thing we were lacking was firewood. I had packed a bundle of branches in the saddlebags, but no wood. Luckily, I had enough branches to keep a small fire going most of the night. I let Anarchy sleep, as she had more wounds than I, and needed the rest to recover. I stayed up through the night, feeding the fire and watching for the dragon. I expected him to return during the night, and did not want to be taken by surprise again.